Welcome to the Engage 416 podcast. I'm your host, Detective Constable Sean Garris with the Integrated Gang Prevention Task Force and the Engage 416 Initiative. Today, I am here with a guest that is familiar to the show. He's been on the show with us before. It is Richard Nelson. I got his name right this time. Uh, He is a graduate from York University, an honors graduate in criminology, he also has some lived experience in one of the neighborhoods that I well, worked in when I was working in 31 Division, a gang-impacted neighborhood, uh, Shoreham Court. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the neighborhood? Uh, well, no, welcome to the show first. Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm happy to be back. Honestly, it feels good to be back. Um, and um, I'm just happy to be having these conversations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we talked a little bit about uh, prior to off, off the recording about how the first um recording how the first podcast was responded to your friends and family oh yeah um very positive feedback everyone enjoyed the conversations and the content of the podcast it opened a lot of eyes and uh people learned a lot uh there were a lot of questions that people have been asking themselves for a long time that were answered through this podcast so Mm -hmm. uh seeing um this information being brought forward to people it uh definitely is a really good feeling Mm -hmm. yeah well, I'm hoping to do that again for you. I mean, I, I record the podcast. So I don't get a lot of feedback. I wish we did. So, folks, if you're out there and you're listening to the podcast, one thing that you can do is you can talk to uh, uh, Richard, but you can also get on our social media and give us feedback as to if you enjoyed it, uh, tell us what you didn't enjoy or whatever, uh, tell us your opinion on certain subjects as well. You can chime in. So do that for us uh, um, as you're listening today. Um, but yeah, I wanted to talk about, uh, well, of course you've got the academic, uh, smarts now that, uh, well, you always had that, but you've got the paper to go along with it. That's right. Um, so you've studied, uh, criminology and you must've studied and related some of your papers that you wrote, uh, to, you know, what your lived experience was. Oh yes. Um, absolutely. So, uh, in regarding, like regarding to schooling and, um, just my lived experience, uh, I noticed that a lot of the content I had to write about was about why people did the things they did, especially in terms of why people commit crimes. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it related a lot to me because uh, something specific we did touch on was gang culture. Um, We uh, had a whole unit about this. Uh, We went very much into depth about this. And some of the main reasons that people usually get into gangs well at least traditionally is because uh they usually lack a basic family unit and they try to find some type of substitute something that we did touch on that i believe that not many other years before me have touched on is that there's a new reason and it's become popular it's a way to fit in it may not necessarily be for family reasons but a way to gain some kind of um kind of like moving up in a social hierarchy because of how much it has become prevalent in uh, pop culture. Mm-hmm. So that's something that uh, I've definitely had to write about a lot in my life. And how it relates to my life is that I've seen these things firsthand and I've seen people go down these roads firsthand and everything I wrote about, about was true and I could relate to it because I've seen it firsthand. Mm-hmm. And that's the, uh, I think that's the main thing that uh, relates to me in terms of schooling and uh, living in a gang impacted area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd say that's that pretty much is short form. I can go really longer, but that that's short form. Oh, we're gonna get you to go longer. Tell you the truth, where that's why you're <laughs> we're here. We're gonna try to keep you talking. Uh, you're talking about risk factors, uh, pushing and pulling people into the uh, into the gang subculture, uh, and you know, I, of course, there's a lot of and I, I gave you a placard. Uh, people can't see it who's who are listening, but if you're watching. Uh, you could probably see the placard that I'm holding up, but it was something that we gave out at our uh, gang prevention town hall meetings. Um, but this was a list compiled by the United in the United States. It was um, at the National Gang Center down there, um, and they talk about various risk factors, not just family, but other community, uh, individual, peer, uh, school, and 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 um, peer, sorry, individual, family, school, peer. Uh, and major risk factors and community. So I wanted to get into those two, but you kind of started it off with uh, uh, you talked about hierarchy. You know, a hierarchy in the in the neighborhood, mm-hmm. a hierarchy, and I and imagine social media is contributing to that very much. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, with the rise of um, I'd say a lot of prominent, I'd, I'm going to say former gangsters, mm-hmm. a lot of people that used to be very much involved in gangs. We're talking 
people that have been doing this for a very long time suddenly finding fame mm -hmm. and it could either be through you know making music about their experiences in gangs becoming popular or even just um, being well known and then eventually becoming like an influencer on social media mm -hmm. um, especially with how like kind of the way that social media works nowadays is like a medium it's no longer just something for fun it's more like a, a town hall a digital town hall people see these people moving up higher and it uh it basically plants this idea in a lot of people's minds that okay how did they get here i need to replicate this their entire story and sometimes that story may involve joining gangs mm -hmm. and that's what i've noticed a lot of people there are people that even be that will be mentioning, uh, you know, certain slang, certain like, certain sayings and all that stuff. They have no idea what it means, but it may be rooted in gang culture. It just became popular. That's how that's how deep this goes. So um, I'd say that's a big thing with social hierarchy. Uh, on top of that, you see, you know, people in your neighborhoods that will be, you know, taking care of things. It could be buying food or or doing donations and. They may be getting these funds through gang-related activities, and people see this, and a lot of people say, "Hey, I want to be like that. I, the only way that I can get there, is by doing what this person does." And that's what I've been noticing for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. So you see uh, the influencing of gangs in, in the neighborhood. You're, I think, you're talking about how, and I and I read it in a, in a book called. Um, uh, Gang Leader for a Day by Sadir Venkatesh. And I'm, I'm sure if you're familiar with his work, Freakonomics, uh, I think that's where he, he kind of got a little bit famous from there. Yeah. Uh, but he talked about the interconnection of, of uh, I guess, the community and gang and how the gang is supported by the community or why it's supported by the community. And, and I think it's a process of, of reciprocity. You know, the gang buys a, uh, you know, a, a mother, a single mother, some diapers, and there's some sort of they're indebted to do something for them. And whether it's something serious, maybe hiding an individual, or maybe just uh, keeping a lookout for them, stuff like that. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of, well, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these gangs, and it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of crazy how the community community works because a lot of the time a gang may just do things to do things because it's like this is my neighborhood, I'm just gonna make sure that this neighborhood is okay. In terms of like people have this and people have that, mm -hmm. but what I've noticed is that a lot of people don't necessarily have to do things in return, but people it's just human nature. People feel indebted. They feel like they have to do something in return. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say in most cases um, where people do things, it's not really because they they have to. It's because they feel they have to. Also, you have to understand that a lot of people in the neighborhood have seen people that like currently have the power in these gangs. They've seen them grow up since they were babies, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's just a matter of like, oh, this is these are my people. I have to take care of them, and that's just the way how that's how it's always been. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's been this way for a really long time now. Yeah. You talked about uh, they've seen them grow up to be babies. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to talk about was the, the where and what age does a child get exposed to gang culture? Ooh, ooh that depends. Uh, very young. Very young. Um, even saying 12 years old is too generous. Mm -hmm. People are exposed from very young. It usually starts off from seeing it in your neighborhoods. I'd say around 12, they usually get involved, but when they really get privy to what's going on, six or seven, that's when they really start to say, hey, I want to be like this. They usually see it from you know their older brothers or sisters, their parents, maybe um, a role model that they look up to in the community, and they just see that, and they just want to be that. They start replicating their mannerisms. They start replicating what they do, what they wear, how they talk, and eventually when they, usually when they get into like bigger friend groups, as they get older, they decide, you know what, I'm gonna do this now. And that's usually around 12, 13. But I'd say kids nowadays are getting used to this way younger. We're seeing kids as young as four or five. 
that are starting to replicate these behaviors and that's just because that's what they think is the right thing to do so very very young you said you're you're seeing this you're seeing this in an, in the neighborhood it's just, this you're not a, you're not talking about statistics oh no no i've seen this in the neighborhood and it's yeah. been around for a while like it's not anything new even when i was 4 or 5 like i didn't know exactly what everything meant but i had an idea of what it meant and i've seen you know people act a certain way or do certain things um and there were people my age at the time maybe when we were in first or second grade you know they would talk about like you know for lack of a better term like terms like op block like oh we're gonna go to this op block we're gonna go to that op block they'd start saying like oh this is my gang this that and the third these things are replicated from very young and i've seen this with my own eyes my my peers have done this you know what i mean so uh yeah that's that's kind of the reality of the situation. So, like representing like a uh, like a it would be like a sports team. You know, you I I like the San Francisco Forty Nine ers. So I'm gonna I'm not gonna talk smack about the Forty Nine ers. You start smack talk smack about the Forty Nine ers. I'm gonna get upset and I'm gonna come at you with all the stats and stuff like that. Right. Exactly. That's the same thing that's happening within the the community with the gang culture. Exactly. And something that I've noticed is that it's getting much more severe. And in terms of it may not be getting much more severe in terms of actions being done while you know it is still a problem it is getting much more severe in the intensity it's kind of like i'd say the best way to put it is like the cold war it's like nothing major is happening in the moment but you can feel the tensions rising because of who's in power mm -hmm. and nowadays i've noticed that youth are becoming much more there's there's less uh there's less balance it's much more like there's a term that people are using called crashing out it's like you have to make the most noise you have to disrespect the other side as much as possible you have to prove yourself and you have to do it through violence it's not a matter of doing it through flaunting your money anymore it's doing it through violence and that's something that's on the rise not just over here but over, everywhere it's actually trending now on TikTok. There's like a whole video genre about it. There's a whole genre of, it's called crash out rap. It's insane. And they talk about doing heinous acts, terrible acts, right? And that's how, that's how people gain their street cred now. It's not about flaunting money. It's not about saying this, these people support me. It's about, I'm, I'm going to talk about these violent acts and I need someone to give me a reason to prove that I will do it to show that I'm really what I am talking about. And it's becoming much more severe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because back in the day when I first started policing, it was about, you know, who had the money, who had the, the girls, um, who, you know, who had the power in the neighborhood. Um, now it's not so much about those things, the drugs. Uh, it's more so about the street cred. Uh, yeah. is, that's what I'm getting from here. Exactly. Uh, and while it's always been street cred to a point, it's how you get the street cred that's changed a lot. So like you said, back in the day, it was about the money, the girls, you know, how much power you had in the neighborhood. Nowadays, it's how much violence can you inflict and how severe can it be? Mm -hmm. um, that's why, for example, let's say that there's a, a street level dealer, probably won't get much notoriety nowadays, but somebody that probably isn't making any money but goes down the street and shoots three or four people all of a sudden they're may not they may not be praised but they're internet famous mm -hmm. and we've seen this happen before uh even um was it earlier this year when there was a there was a shooting um at driftwood mm -hmm. bus stop okay yeah with the with a 16 year old and, and a bike, yeah. yeah and um people were sus they suspected it was the same person we don't know who this person is but that person even with being anonymous got more street cred than a lot of people that aren't doing that and that's the state of how gang culture has become nowadays it's mm -hmm. about how much violence you can inflict as much as possible because that shows that you are what you are talking about and it's become pretty, it's become a scary thing. Yeah. And I think it, with the event of social media, I think that's the main reason why this is happening because there is an audience. Oh, yes. There is very much an audience. It's like, um, it's like, P 
people think it's real. I mean, and the thing is, it is real, but that's the scary part. Mm -hmm. They say that this is the, the reality of the situation, but it's kind of a, it's kind of ironic because it wasn't the case before until people started, you know, maybe it happened once or twice, people started talking about it, glorifying it, and then it became more frequent. So to call it real is kind of, it's like artificial realness. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, it, it's become this like poisonous thing where people keep praising it or the people that aren't praising it necessarily are promoting it willingly or unwillingly. And it's become so severe. It's becoming such a problem in the city, in every major city. It's not even just Canada. It's, it's, it's gotten so far out of reach that unless something is done soon, it's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't want people to realize that how bad it can truly get bef like before it's too late. And it, it, is, it is pretty bad. From what I'm seeing, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, I mean, you're front line. You're, you're there. You're, you, you're, you know, I've had a seat to the violence, but you've grown up in the violence as well. Yeah. And if you've seen it from day one, progress to where it's at the point where like it's out of control, you, you got to be a subject matter expert on this. Yeah. Unwillingly. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking to see, you know, because it's uh the problem is it's not necessarily affecting the people that are mostly involved with this mm -hmm. it's like before if there was a shooting it's regardless it's sad it'd be usually targeted but now it's targeted but anything else is just collateral damage so part of the mission it's not uh as long as you get the main objective done that's the point so it could be one person's targeted but you see on the news, four people got shot. Mm -hmm. In the minds of a lot of people in these gangs nowadays is, well, you got the person, the three other pe people are just collateral, collateral damage, that's just life. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's pretty, yeah, that's what it's becoming now. Yeah. You know, I had read in, in a couple of uh, books down south, uh, well, Americanized books, uh, when they talked about some Latino gangs where they rationalized it away, like, you know, with that kid, well, we killed, uh, uh, you know, an innocent kid during that mission. Well, you know what? They were going to grow up to be a supporter of the gang or a gang member, so we did that. We did ourselves a favor. That's how they'd rationalize it away. Uh, and it'd be, it, it was nothing to them. It was, like you said, it was, I, we completed the mission, bang on. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's, um... And that's actually, I'm glad that you brought up things from down south. Um, it's because we are starting to, from what I'm, at least I'd say nine years ago, eight years ago, Toronto had a very distinct gang culture. Mm. Even though it was influenced from the U.S., it was still distinct in its own way. It's kind of looking like nowadays we're starting to get away more from the U.S. and like implementing more into the gang culture here because... Once again, social media, we're seeing a lot more, like, the lines between Toronto and the U.S., ironically, have been blurred. Mm. People are calling Toronto, like, whenever people compare Toronto to another city, they always compare it to a U.S. city. It's never another Canadian city. city. And people have been doing that more and more. And we're seeing that even when it comes to these kind of things. Um, a lot of people want to be uh, what the Americans are doing right because it's cool it's cool on social media that's what they want to do and that bleeds into all aspects of life even the negatives and um yeah so that whole mindset about well we're on a mission we got to get it done anyone else is in the way it's collateral damage and trying to rela rationalize it well that person was most likely gonna do something to hurt us in the future that has become way more prevalent and it's Honestly, yeah, the way that they're doing it, is, like down south, it's exactly the way it's going right now. I wouldn't even say moving towards it. We're already at that point. And, um, yeah. Yeah, we've gotten to a point where we've emulated the neighbors to the south, whether it's eating their McDonald's, yeah. uh, Burger King, uh, supersizing everything up here. You know what? The gang culture is spread up here. I remember, you know, growing up, and the only real gang influences I had growing up was watching 
movies like Colors and mm-hmm. um, The Warriors and stuff like that. And, you know, I bought into that. I was like, this is pretty cool. And when you talk about, you know, how the kids are kind of mesmerized by, by you know, gangs and, and, and you know, and, or people are buying into the violence as well. And there, there's more people that are uh, supporting these guys that are talking about violent acts on social media. Some people may find that hard to believe. Ah, that's just a group of, you know, kids, uh, you know, don't worry about them. It's, it's huge. Mm-hmm. Um, if you think about the UFC folks, you know, think about the viewership there. That's violence. That's pure violence. And then, you know, you have idiots on those, uh, you know, that are, I'm going to get paid mail. But you have some idiots, uh, fighters that just, uh, you know, just talk out of their butts when they're, when they're, you know, trying to promote. And I get it, they're trying to promote. But they're talking smack. And that's exactly what's happening on the internet with this gang subculture as well. There's an audience that just feeds into this as well. And they're just, you know, taking in whatever, you know, the gang member is saying and, and, you know, just cheering them on, just like your favorite UFC fighter. You know, there is a, obviously, there, there, there is an appetite in hum, the human psyche for violence. Uh, if, if there wasn't, we wouldn't have the UFC. We wouldn't have had boxing. We wouldn't have uh, martial arts. Uh, you know, all that stuff is there because, you know, there is an appetite for it. Violence is goes to, a, you know, the violence and gang violence. And now that it's being promoted through social media, um, uh, and I don't think... You know, it wasn't something that, you know, was social media was invented for. And I don't think there's a company that's actually going out promoting it. But the these, I'm going to say, drill music artists are producing it more and more and more and glorifying it more and more. And what's happening now is you're, you've got tons. And if you look at these guys that are involved in the gang subculture that are drill music artists, their followers are like in the millions. And so, you know, it's it's they're reaching a lot of people. That's just maybe one or two right yeah um, and you think about all over the world like you said oh yeah like there are drill artists just in toronto uh drill in toronto still developing which is crazy because it's already reached a point where it's so vivid but it's still developing uh, a lot of the artists have probably hundreds of million i'm sorry not hundreds of, million, hundreds of thousands mm. and some are approaching that one million mark especially on instagram but you look in new york some of these artists talking about some pretty, pretty wild acts that have happened because a lot of them get arrested after the fact they, you know, release the music. They detail everything in their crimes. You see 3 million, 4 million, 10 million, 20 million followers. And it's like, yeah, it's like, oh, wow, this guy's like, this guy is like, oh, he's talking like a warrior. And that's, it's like a, it's being um, branded as like a warrior culture thing. And that's, it, it looks good to people, mm-hmm. you know, seeing, you know, warrior, like fighting like warriors, like they're going to the battlefield and they're fighting for what they believe in. Um, it's talked about like it's something noble. And that's why I feel like people gravitate to it, especially if you grow up around it or are, you know, you have some knowledge about it. It, it can seem like something that's noble. And I feel like that's why it keeps growing. That's why it still has so much pull and reach um, just because of that. Because it seems like a noble cause, the way it's talked about. When you're talking about it seems like it's a noble cause, you're talking about young kids in the neighborhood that are viewing the gang membership in their area as a noble cause or a you know like, a, like something that would cheer them on? Yeah, exactly. Um, they view it almost as if it's like... Uh, I'd say the best way to put it is like, for example, in Jane and Finch, mm-hmm. kids seeing these gang members operate and do what they do would be similar to seeing a Canadian citizen seeing Canadian soldiers operate. It's like they're protecting me and where I'm from, mm-hmm. and that's how that's how it's that's how far it's reached. And don't get me wrong, it I like when when there's not much. Uh, positives happening at any given time i can understand but that's how far it's reached and that's just the reality it's almost as if these guys are volunteering to protect us take care of us etc etc and i want to be just like them you know it's the same reason why you see a lot of kids that live in uh military towns that are joining the military joining the military because that's what they see that's what they respect except in this way instead of serving 
the community, the true reality of gangs is that they mostly serve themselves, right? Mm-hmm. And it's just portrayed as something as like some kind of defense force or protective force or like some neighborhood watch. That's how it's portrayed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Sort of like, well, almost like brainwashing the young kids at a young age, to, you know. Yeah. All right, you know, I guess I, I think we talked last time, I equated it to like a, like a football team. Right, you grow up with the, you know, your your you know, your exposure to whatever, you know, at a young age, and you grow up as a, let's say, Cowboys. I don't like the Cowboys. So, well, you say the Cowboys. You, your parents have are Cowboys fans, and then they, you know, all of a sudden you become a Cowboys fan too because because of that as well. But now you're saying, uh, you're cheering them on, but there's also they also have this added layer where they become the protectors, mm-hmm. so it almost like ups their value in, uh, mm-hmm. the gang the gang culture because. You know, now they're not only my heroes because, you know, they've, you know, I believed in them when I was younger, but now they're doing this noble cause or what they perceive to be noble. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's all, it's like indoctrination mm-hmm. and it's indoctrination where it's not intended to be indoctrination. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes it so effective. It's like if there's something that it doesn't seem like you're learning but you are taking away from it, it's the most effective thing. You know what I mean? It's like when you're watching a basketball game, you don't watch it intending to learn the game most of the time, but you do learn new things from it without even realizing. And that's the, I say that's what makes it so effective. That's what makes anything like this so effective. That's what, um, that's how people get other people to do terrible things all the time. It's like, uh, it's like indoctrination without it intending to be indoctrination. And, uh, yeah, just, like, through action. Indoctrination through action. I'd say that's the main... I think that's the best way to really call it what mm-hmm. it is. Yeah. 